Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer, Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Kip, welcome to the uh, Digital Workspace Works podcast. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself? I'd be happy to do that. Thank you for having me in the episode. Really appreciate it. So my name's Kip Boyle, and I work as a uh, fractional chief information security officer. Some people call it a virtual chief information security officer. It's interesting. We haven't seemed to really land on a on a single title yet. Uh, but I live and work uh, in the in the Seattle area. Actually, we have customers all over the world. And I founded a company called Cyber Risk Opportunities in 2015. And that's that's my company, got a staff of six and a bunch of subcontractors. And, um, and you know, and, and so what we do is we provide leadership to uh, organizations that uh, either don't have somebody who can provide uh, strategic focus on cybersecurity or uh, maybe they just need some help, you know, getting certain things uh, pulled together. But in any event, that's what I spend my time doing these days. I'm a, I'm also a husband and a dad, and um, I, I really enjoy traveling. Um, and so thankfully, I get to do that as part of my work. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, our usual question is, is, you know, what does the digital workspace mean to you? Can you, can you give us what your, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so we're a we're a uh, my company is a, uh, a is a remote only firm, so we don't have a centralized office. And I've actually been uh, working remotely uh, for quite some time now. I think the first time that that I started working in an all digital uh, situation was um, 1998, believe it or not. And um, you know, I, I remember having to wrestle with uh, analog. Uh, modem lines in order to be able to do that. And I remember getting our first uh, cable modem, which was an absolute boon. It felt like I was in the office at that point, and um, and it just really changed everything. So for me, you know, a, a digital office is, is really about being able to work wherever you need to be and, and to be able to get work done as though you were in, in a physical office. Yeah. I think the, the good thing about the pandemic is everyone else has understood that now with new challenges. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, I, I like you started off my career working remotely and had these periods where I worked in an office. And I don't think either one's necessarily better than the other one. I think whatever suits what you do and, and how you do it. But it's interesting how you know, your comment about working anywhere, anytime and on any device you know, has become such a, a fluid thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and I feel really, really blessed and fortunate that that I've been able to do it for so long now, whereas other people through the pandemic, as you said, are just finding out about how amazing it can really be. And I was reading some comments recently about just how thrilled that there was this uh, this one uh, woman who was making a comment about just how tremendous it was that that uh, the work from home uh, opportunity for her and and it, just how it freed her up to do so many more things and and it and it allowed her to stop doing things that you know that were not value added like commuting for example and um and it it actually reinvigorated me because uh you know you get to a point where you sort of uh, just accept that this is you know this flexibility you know that you have it and uh, it's easy to forget that there was a time when you did not have it it's so true you know, we, as I said to you before we started recording, I mean, I'm down in Fancourt in South Africa in George. And, you know, three years ago, I used to have fights with a boss to come out to South Africa for a month to see family. Now it's not even a discussion. It's like, well, I'm going to be there this week. And, and everyone else I know is also doing that. I mean, we were on a call this morning where, where one of the people was saying, well, you know, I'm here with my daughter. She's writing her exam. Oh, I see she's finishing early. So I'm going to guess we're going to be driving in the car this afternoon. So I can't do any of those meetings. We're driving back. I was like, oh, okay, can't you do me from the car? Well, no, we're talking to my daughter. You know, we're spending quality time. I can work when I get home. And it's a completely, you know, these are, these are, you know, culturally people that are typically would have said, you know, we have to do the meetings first. 
and then right. do the personal stuff. And now it's the it's switched around, which I think is healthier for for people generally. Which means they're probably making you know better decisions because they're not stressing about the work before the the personal stuff. Right. Anyway, we yeah. talk about this one for hours. Um, so let's chat. You you had a book um, last time. We we obviously re recording this because we had some audio issues. So we've had a discussion before. Um, you had a book that you've written. Uh, maybe let's talk start off with that, and you can frame that for us and and uh, highlight what you want people to get out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's called Fire Doesn't Innovate, and the title of my book is really a um, uh, a, a reference to the fact that uh, cyber risk, which is what I spend my time focusing on, helping companies figure out you know what their cyber risks are and how to deal with them, that cyber risk is a very different type of risk. It's a dynamic business risk. It's not just a technical annoyance, which it has been for the longest time. You know, we we only really had to deal with it as oh, somebody defaced a, our website. Let's get it cleaned up. Or uh, you know, Joe in accounting has a virus on his PC. Let's get that scrubbed and cleaned so that he can work this afternoon. I mean, these were irritants, you know. But but that's not true anymore. And what I observed in my work is that senior decision makers. Uh, are still think of cyber in this way, which I don't think is helpful to them because that's just not what it is any longer. And so I wrote my book for senior decision makers who don't have technical backgrounds, but who absolutely have to figure out how to get their arms around the topic of cyber risk and what does it mean for their organization and what are they going to do about it? Um, and so the, uh, the the title of the book is really uh, trying to capture, trying to really hook people, right? To make them realize that, um, you know, this is a very different type of risk. It's dynamic. It's not a static risk, which fire is a static risk. And I can unpack that metaphor, but, um, but you know, that's kind of, that was the idea. Yeah, I, I think it's a point. I think when we spoke last, uh, I had spoken to probably about a dozen CEOs and of that dozen eight that had issues recently. And I've been talking down to the day with things they hadn't even conceived. Um, and in fact, I'm now talking to a business to start in January who wants a BCP, uh, business continuity plan to restart their entire business as a min minimal viable business mm. um, if they were to be hit by an incident. And it, it's it's definitely a kind of thinking I hadn't ever conceived people having, if, if you know what I mean. Like you normally feel like you've got to get an education yes. and, and whatever. And this was just a random conversation where they were saying, well, you know, could you help us design our backup business? And I thought they meant a BCP plan uh, or a BCP mechanism. Like, no, 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 we wanted to be able to launch a second business if we have to from scratch as a sort of, you know, automated pop up and go, you know, whatever it is, you, know, you, t you tell us how we, if we can do this. And I was like, well, what, what's driven this? And they said, no, it's, it's the risk. I of, love it. It's a risk of ransomware. It's the risk of of employees that know where all the important things are, and if and if they decide to be malicious, we can do nothing about it. So, you know, and it's also the risk of legacy. You know, we're a, a really yes. old organization that's grown through attrition, uh, not attrition through acquisition, with so many complicated systems, we wouldn't even know where to start in some cases, or or what to do if we lost one of these things. So we need to. This is absolutely debate. fascinating. I love yeah. this. Yeah. So I'll yeah. keep you in the loop as we go on that. But but it, it's it's yeah. so fresh. Can, can I say a word about that? I want to say oh, a word about ahead. that because what I tell my customers is that, and and really the name of my company, I, I try I try uh, I, I named my company what I did because I would like it to reflect this idea that you just brought up, which is that cyber risk isn't all downside and it isn't all just ones and zeros. That there's yeah. real opportunity in cyber risk if you can understand it conceptually you don't have to understand it technologically and if you embrace it right so for example the whole idea of being resilient is uh, cyber resilient is a tremendous opportunity for organizations i love the example you gave where and it kind of reminds me of a pc where you get a virus on it uh and instead of trying to get the virus out you just say you know what let's just scrub this thing clean and start afresh because we don't know that we're ever going to get that virus completely out of that machine. So let's just hit the reset button. Um, and it's sort of what it, that sounds like. And, and, and whoever in the history of organizations before now 
would have ever thought that way because, you know, the cyber risks were never present in the way they are now. Um, and so the idea to be to be resilient, to stay in business when your competitors cannot because they've been hit by a cyber attack and they actually stopped functioning. You might have been hit by the same cyber attack, but because you're resilient, you stayed in business. And there's a whole story in my book about how this actually happened in 2017. DHL in Europe and uh, TNT Express, which is owned by FedEx, they both got hit by a, uh, a data wiping worm called NotPetya. And one of those organizations stopped functioning. The other one didn't. And you can what's brilliant about this case is you can look in their public financial results and you can very clearly see one of these organizations volumes up, revenues up, profits up. The other one was completely the opposite story. And um, and so the company that stayed in business when the other one couldn't has reaped long term benefits because getting people to switch from one carrier to another carrier is very, very, very difficult under normal circumstances. There's so much inertia. But this event happened and the company that stayed in business received a windfall simply because they've stayed resilient. Yeah. No, and and I mean, I've had friends working in logistic companies that had this, that um, I don't know if they were linked to that one specifically, but the other, the other challenge you have with the amount of technology that's floating around, people don't know how to do things manually anymore. Or they, they've yes. lost that training on, you know, writing an order book and all that kind of stuff. And we, we were moaning about it the other day because we, we went to the doctor and we had to fill in all these forms. We were sort of saying, but, but we've already got everything digitally. Why do you need this, the forms? And someone actually said, well, it's in the event that the computers go down, I still have the paperwork that you've signed and filled in, handwritten. Yes. Um, even though I have three backups and da 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 all the stuff I have to meet for compliance, I've still got the paper. And I was like, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. I mean, it's still irritating, but it kind of makes sense. And and this is the thing. I mean, your your resilience can take different forms, even though everything's pushed towards a digital technology. One of those things has to be a consideration for paper. Good old fashioned. Oh, paper. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, even such, even a small thing like, uh, you know, when I talk to a new customer and I say, well, tell me about your digi- your disaster recovery plans. Tell me about your business continuity plans. And even if they have wonderful plans, they're sitting on a computer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and yep. so I ask them, if that computer is suddenly unavailable to you, how will you reference your plan? And you can just see a little, you know, sp- uh, sparking light bulb over their head because they hadn't thought about it. <laughs> no, well, no one does because we get so co- we get so co- um, comfortable with the technology. Um, right. And, and I had this this uh, it's funny. I was actually thinking about now I'm in this hotel and I'm in the boardroom. So I left everything here and I went for a walk. And I mean. You know, and I was thinking, funnily enough, on my walk that I'm going to talk to you now in 20 minutes. And I suddenly thought, you know what? I actually left everything in the hotel room. I didn't even lock the door. I was so trusting of everyone that I could have come back here and everything would have been gone. Um, could have happened. I'm know, glad it didn't. It didn't happen, but but you know, it it could have happened. So right. you know, even 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 us that are supposed to be aware of these things can can fall into the com- the, the complacency problem. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that can absolutely happen. So um, but just kind of to roll back. Right. So you asked me about my book. And yeah. so part one of my book is really uh, a a, um, uh, a primer, if you will, of how should how should a senior decision maker who is not technologically uh, accomplished? How should how should that person think about cyber risk? And so that's what part one of my book is about. Part two of my book is actually a a methodology and a toolkit for how we actually discover the top five cyber risks for our customers and then create a prioritized mitigation plan. And and this is really important because what most people struggle with is they're facing unlimited cyber risk, but they have only a limited budget and they don't know where to start. They're very confused about, you know, I have a dollar to spend or I've got a pound to spend. Uh, you know, what's what's the best you know return for that? And I I learned about this a long time ago when I worked as a chief information security officer for an insurance company. And the CFO asked me to come and speak with him one day. And I I said, well, yeah, I'll be right over, Steve. And and so he said, um, 
He said, look, I, I got your budget here. And, you know, this is the third time around where you've sent me your budget, your budget. you know, uh, and and I, I support what you're doing. But the budget gets bigger every year and I don't really understand it. At the same time, I've got people from marketing and sales and operations all saying, hey, Steve, I need money for this and that and the other thing. And he goes, but, but I don't know. I don't know how to tell them that I'm giving Kip twenty five thousand dollars to do a, a what's it's. <laughs> and you want twenty five thousand dollars to do you know good things that I understand. He said, Kip, help me because I don't know how to tell them why I'm giving you the money. And so that sort of began this very long collaborative relationship where I got intensely focused on what is the business value of of digital security. What is the value of that? And and that was really where. Um, uh, I had my most transformative experience in my career, and 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 as a result, uh, has informed what I'm doing today, and the book, and the podcast, and the the uh, courses that I teach, and so forth. Yeah, and and I, and I love the you use the word business value because that is such a nebulous term that's thrown out, and and you know you and I are on very similar paths, which we'll talk about another time. But but it's this it's it's exactly this problem that that we. And this is about I mentioned the, the education piece, because you often have to draw and, and, and people you're talking to are not idiots. I mean, obviously, they they are very you know good at what they do. They've got their for for being good at what they do. But this is a space that and I'm talking obviously about the, the, the cyber risk space within the, the technology space in some respects. But it's also it's you know, it's a it's, a, it's also a broad space because the, the the vectors of attack are so diverse, you, you know, the. It, it's too much to be an expert in it, to be honest. I mean, you could you could That's have right. an expert, you can have an expert in a domain, uh, maybe two or three domains if you if you really have the time and the and the expertise. But you know, it, it it's something you've got to navigate. And and this is where, I mean, I'm, I'm reading the reviews in your book again. You know, I think you've done that really well in providing the part one, the part two, where you've given the people without the background something to hold on to, and then how to do it. And that's what people look for is tell me how to do it. Yes. And thank you for acknowledging that because that is, that is, you know, my goal. And an, another good use case for my, uh, for my book, by the way, is I've, I've noticed in, in the course of my working life that there's this tremendous chasm uh, between the people who are leading the technology functions in an organization versus the people who are leading, shall we say, the non-technological functions of an organization. So sales and marketing and, and operations and so forth. There's this huge communications chasm. And I, I, while I'm not trying to help with that, Overall, I I do want to help with the cybersecurity part of it, and so a good use case for my book is if you're a senior decision maker and you can't understand what the IT per person is saying to you because of all the ones and zeros coming out of their mouth, read my book part one and then give it to the IT person and say I would like you to read part one and then I would like to talk to you because I'm seeing things in this book that I think we are going are struggling with and I would like to speak to them to you about them. And that use case goes the other way too. If you're a senior decision maker who's very, very technical, but you don't have a, a great vocabulary to bring these issues up with the senior decision maker, then you can give them part one of my book and say the very same thing to them. And you will then create a, a very, a very a basic bridge across that chasm, which you can then build up. Yeah, and, and I mean that is the point, really. Is 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 it's it's building a bridge that you can strengthen for continuous working together because this is it's not a, a one and done thing. I think this is the other thing people don't get often is that the reason why the the, the budget gets bigger and bigger is because the problem doesn't go away necessarily. You just mitigate some of the problem, or you you know uh, expose. That's right. That's right. One you expose on another, and that's the dynamic nature of it, right? I mean, we don't really worry about fire anymore, right? London burnt to the ground once upon a time, at least once. Seattle, where I live, burnt to the ground at least once. Chicago, big cities in the world have burnt to the ground because we tried to bring fire into the cities, but we didn't know how to control it. But but we couldn't live without it. We had to have it. And so we we sorted it out. And nowadays, it's very rare for for a fire, to, a major fire to break out in a city. And when it does, it's contained and dealt with in a fairly efficient way. But it wasn't always like that in human history. 
And the reason why it is because fire is a static risk. Once once yeah. we've gotten it under control, it's going to stay under control unless we lose our grip. <laughs> but no, sure. cyber is a dynamic risk, and it's always going to change. So we're never going to have it totally under control. Yeah, and, and actually, it's interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking about the Grenfell Fire in London. Uh, and when was that? That was probably 2017, I think. And that was a big deal because it not only was it a fire that a lot of people died, it was a fire that could have been avoided if they'd used uh, appropriate building materials and they right. used some sort of mesh that was highly flammable and that made it worse. And then also the people living there couldn't get out fast enough. And, you know, I don't want to cheapen what happened there to, to those people, but it is kind of the same thing in, in what we're saying about from a business value point of view, where you're explaining what the risks are and how to get there. And if you cut corners, you end up with a bigger disaster, which in today's day's age, you know, a, a if you are a, um, especially with GDPR and 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 those and some of the um, the U.S. legislations coming in, if you break if you have a privacy breach, the fine can shut you down. Um, yeah, it can a, really. It, let, let's just say it'll be a material event for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Uh, and and there's yeah. a, there's not a lot of insurance you can buy for it either anymore because all the insurance companies because of all the uh, ransomware and and the breaches are, are not insuring for certain things anymore because. That's a good, awesome material. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so not only is cyber insurance difficult to get right now, although I think, you know, that that will unwind a little bit. I think it'll get a little bit better. I'm I'm working very closely uh, with people who are trying to get cyber insurance right now. So I'm, I'm regularly uh, in, in that space. But what I want to say, though, back to your point about that fire in London, is because they cut corners and chose the wrong materials for their building project, I don't know for sure, but my guess would be that they didn't get the insurance coverage because they didn't they didn't abide by the requirements of the insurance to use the correct materials. I can tell you that in a cyber insurance situation, if you say in the uh, application that you do these things, and then you file a claim and it turns out you don't do those things, then you'll be given your premium back. The policy will be null and you'll be on the hook for everything. So why would you why would you? get a policy and then cut the corners like that, I, you're just not, I don't think you're fully realizing what you're doing to yourself. Um, so one of the things I tell my customers about this is, um, is that I don't want you to think about cyber security as this cost center. I don't want you to think about it as, um, as a technical thing. What I want you to do is think of it as high performance brakes on a sports car. Because if you didn't have high performance brakes on a sports car, how fast would you dare to drive it? No, well, exactly. I think that's a great analogy. I guess the only thing is they would say we'd never buy the fancy car, but that's that's probably just uh, <laughs> the accountant talking. Well, um, they all they all seem to want to, to drive a fancy car and they oh, want to sorry, drive real sorry, fast. Yeah. And and really the analogy, right, is their business, right? So it's like yeah. if you think of your business as as you know as as something that you want to go fast and you want it to perform well, which of course we all do. I'm a business owner. That's how I want my business to, to behave. I need to have a great set of brakes because uh, if risk shows up, I, I need to be able to to respond. And I need to be able to swerve around whatever it is that's fallen in my path. And then I need to keep going again. And so uh, so I encourage them to, to slow down, to go fast, get those brakes on. And so every now and then you can tap those brakes, navigate around, whether it's something that's fallen in your way or you got a slow person, you got to pass, whatever it is. Those brakes are going to let you get where you want to go. Yeah, look, I, I think your analogy is perfect. I mean, the the. Uh... The, the slowest, fast, and fastest slow sort of mantra is what I was thinking of as you were saying that. And, and I think that is some of the other things is that uh, I, was, I was thinking about the ISO 27K process we went through a few years ago. And there was this big rush to try to get as much stuff done as possible. And it kind of misses the point in some respects because, yes, you need to have the building blocks in place, but you actually need to be looking at your business critically to identify where your risks are. And what you're going to do about it, and that's actually the the real crux of it for, for me. Because once you once you have the plan, and even even though you may not have all the the documentation in place, even though you have a plan to get the document into place and to do the regular reviews and the regular lookbacks and the and the improvements, that helps you set up um, the organization. And also, you know, we involved a lot of people across the business, so it wasn't just technical people in the room; it was the business people as well. 
and that made exactly. everyone part of solving the problem um, or, or be involved in, in that journey, which meant the training was actually quite light. Because when it came to the yeah. training, it was like, yeah, yeah, we've been through this. Okay, we get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was kind of like, aha, uh-huh, we got that. Whereas if in other organizations where I've been, where no one's been involved, and then they come in with the plan and they roll it out and they're like, okay, now you need to learn this whole 60 slide bit of material, you can imagine what the adoption was like. Oh, I've seen, I've seen it with my own eyes, that sort of thing, you know. Um, and I, so I love, I love the way you did that because it really works for me I, because I believe cyber is a team sport. And I think everybody in the organization has to have a role appropriate set of responsibilities so that everyone's pulling on the rope in the same direction, right? I mean, um, nope. it's a business risk. And so everybody has to be involved. I mean, just as much as, as you know, if you're having problems fulfilling the orders that you're taking, all hands on deck, right? Everybody's got to help. Otherwise, we're not going to get paid. Our viability as a business is going to be in jeopardy. One smart ransomware attack will take out you know, your ability to sell, your ability to fulfill, your ability to collect money. And so it can be, you know, it can be the worst possible business risk if it materializes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, as I said, I, I was speaking to some people that had just been through that. And, you know, the devastation, not only does it, um, in some cases, the, the guys can get around it. In some cases, it's devastating to the business. Mm-hmm. And, and to, reputationally as well. Um, you know, some, Absolutely. some organizations, their expectation and what they sign with you as a, as a provider is an expectation that you can meet their needs as from that point of view as well. And when you can't do it, it, it almost voids not only the, the business, but the actual, you know, reputational stuff, too. Gosh, you know, uh, you're hitting on all the great points here, <laughs> because that's another thing I tell my customers is your number one digital asset is your reputation. Because without your reputation, nothing else matters. Nothing else you do will amount to anything. And so uh, so when we work with customers, one of the things we do is we inventory their digital assets. And I always make sure reputation is on that list near the top, if not the top most item. And uh, it's just, I think that's why people hide uh, or, or or at least, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> get really coy when, you know, when something awful happens because they don't want the hit to their reputation. And, um, you know, but that's kind of something that's kind of felt in the gut more than more than brought to the front of the mind. So I, I like to bring it to the front of the mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I was listening to something the other day. They were they were talking about, uh, I think it was one of the countries they were firing their IT guys because they were hacked. And it was a, it was a, another podcast, in fact. And we, the guy was saying, you know, they're getting rid of the guy, IT guys because they got hacked. But that means that no IT person will ever want to work for that country to do any of the security stuff. So that, so they're not realizing that not not only have they been attacked and their reputation been damaged that way, but they also ruin their opportunity to get out of it because no one will want to work with them because right. if you're gonna if you're gonna hold them to the fire, and you know you don't know the whole story. Maybe those those IT people were saying, look, we need to do these things. We need to secure this. We need to patch. We need whatever it is. And they weren't getting any support. Right. Right. And, you know, again, the double whammy of not supporting and then also being criminally yeah. charged, you know. You know, uh, I did a podcast episode on this and I actually made, I actually talk about this on a regular basis. But your IT guy or gal is not your cybersecurity guy or gal. They're not. They, they really, yeah. they, you know, on the surface, you might think they're the same people. But they're not at all. They they focus on different things. They think in different ways, and um, and so I feel badly for IT people being right. held accountable for something like that because I don't believe they were set up for success. Now I don't know the details of that particular uh, incident that you're talking about, but I can just tell you in general, IT people are not really set up for success to deal with some of this cyber risk stuff, um, and oh, and I yeah. and I feel and very I- badly for them for that. And I'm actually glad you made that distinction because I, I didn't make that distinction very well. Um, and actually, if I think about it, some of the best security people I know are not the typical IT person you'd meet. They've, they've got degrees from different industries. I mean, some people were art majors and they were dancers. I mean, really different backgrounds. And that makes yeah, them kind the of best attuned in a way. 
Well, uh, it, it keeps them from falling into the t- into the typical IT way of thinking, I believe, is, is yeah. part of what's going on there. You know, the best crypto programmer I ever worked with was a guy who had a uh, an undergraduate degree in film in, you know, making movies. And, uh, and he was he was marvelous uh, as a cryptographic uh, programmer um, because uh, IT people want things to stay up and running and IT people want things to be open because those are the easiest things to support. But, 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 but open things make me twitchy <laughs> because I know that open <laughs> things are vulnerable things. And, uh, yes. and so, you know, they're all concerned about rolling new things out and, and happy path, right? How great everything's going to be. And I have to do a lot of negative visualization and figure out what could go wrong. Oh. So it's just a completely different mindset. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you need those different mindsets. You need diversity. You need, you know, as many different perspectives as possible. I mean, even even in building, you know, a product or whatever it is. But I think the you know the, the the reality is that the way that something like ransomware has grown is, you know, there's a marketplace to go and sell a ransomware product that you can go buy it for ten, twenty bucks, and you don't have to have the technical skill to roll it out and implement it. And that's a scary thing because that turns anyone into a, a you know a malicious actor, which means yeah, it's more important that everyone's prepared for something like that to come down their mm-hmm. um, their way. Yeah, you're actually scaling crime, right? Is is what that is. And um, w- one of my mentors, his name's Don Parker, and he he wrote a few books and. Um, very influential uh, guy in the 1980s and uh, in early 1990s. And one of the things that he said, and he said this to me like in 1999, is he said, he said, um, I predict that in the not too distant future, um, we will automate crime with software. And he talked a lot about, you know, what that would be like. Now, now, in 1999, that sounded like science fiction. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, but you, it's you not anymore. We're, we're, we're an analog dial-up in, in those days. I mean, you know, you couldn't even get, get a stable connection to play Quake. Or do, in fact, those days would have been Doom. And now you can spin it up in the cloud and have, you know, 5,000 bots running, you know, by accident. Yeah. So it's just crazy the way that code has completely changed the nature of crime, right? Because it's all still crime in the traditional sense. It's just that we've digitized yeah. it and we've allowed it to scale. And so another thing that I tell my customers to help them understand what's going on is I say, every technology that Amazon has to terrorize Walmart is in the hands of the cyber criminals and they can terrorize us with it too. So yeah. you know, th- think of them as a competitor, right? Because they're going to act like a, comp- a competitor. No, and that's it. I mean, it, it's reducing that friction. And and if you look at, there was something else that I was listening to where um, there's, there was, it's actually a new type of bot framework that looks for pricing differences. So if you're selling a device, let's say, uh, I'll use an example of a MacBook Air, $1,000 on the Apple site, for, as an example. And you had a site where it was seven ninety nine or three ninety nine or something like that. There's actually bots that go and look for that. And if they find it for three ninety nine, they'll go buy all of them and then go sell them on eBay for nine ninety nine to make the difference. And the person that that's running that bot thing never actually touches the device, but it's basically a buy and sell drop shipping mechanism. And they've actually yeah. created a whole yeah. whole domain for that. I mean, who would have thought of that as a concept? It's just tremendous. Um, from a career perspective, I think I remember somebody saying that, you know, five years hence, 10 years hence, jobs will exist that we can't even imagine right now. Uh, yeah. As we lose certain jobs, you know, we're going to we're going to find new jobs being created that are unfathomable to our minds because just the context is going to be so different. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, it's I mean, I think I was talking to someone else the other day about critical thinking. And the ability to unlearn and learn things, and that that kind of aligns with that because a lot of people are, I say a lot of people, people young people still think I'm going to be a lawyer, a doctor, whatever it is, and maybe and, and those professions will pretty much probably stay consistent, um, but even in those areas, that the the specialisations are even more uh, nuanced than they were maybe 20 years ago. You, you know, you'd have a cyber uh, specialised attorney now. Right. Um, yeah, for example, in that, but but you know what I mean. And 
Well, you know, cause... yeah, and other things too, like a, a medical doctor, for example, is going to be working with incredibly different tools than 10 years ago, yeah. 20 years ago, right? In the same profession, in the same specialization, um, they're going to be, uh, they're going to have completely different diagnostic equipment. They're going to think about disease in a different way. And so over the course of a 30, 40, 50 year career in, in a discipline, you're going to have to uh, take up and put down tools and take up and put down mental models and take up and put down frameworks at a, at a great pace uh, in order to just, just keep up with the, the change and the innovation. And so it's almost like having uh, a bunch of discrete careers as you, as you move you know, through your life, even though you still say, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, but you know, the nature of that work is, is changing tremendously. And, and if you look at how, I don't know if you looked at Chat, uh, chat GDP uh, recently, but if you look yep. at how that, that has changed things, um, and and you can only imagine that if that and, and that's a really good example of of technology being useful, and 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 I and I say that comparing to other chatbots that I've dealt with this week that have been completely useless. Um, <laughs> you know, I was I was writing code. Uh, that would have probably taken me two or three weeks to write myself, and and I mean that in the sense of having time, you know, researching stuff I was running into, whatever it was, to get that code out. You know, I wrote that same code in maybe an hour, and I say I wrote it. I was asking questions of of that of that chatbot, and it was giving me all the samples and all the examples, and I was just constructing what I needed. Now, if you take that and apply that to the medical field, where you know you're you're asking questions and and getting answers around your symptoms and stuff, you know, there's still a need to have the doctor interpret it and make sure you're not you know going down the wrong wrong path. Mm -hmm. But the model becomes more and more replicable as you go, and and as cyber as a as a knowledge base grows and grows and evolves, that becomes even better because you know you could have the ask the question. I'm a business that's that's located in the U.S., the U.K., whatever it is. I've only I've only got 200 people. What stuff I should be doing on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. And it's giving you the the examples uh, and and helping you to you know plan and, and address issues. And I think this is that that's a really exciting space to to be growing. It it is exciting. It's also dreadful. In the sense that uh, I've been talking to people who find that um, uh, it's going to so change the nature of their work that they're having a hard time envisioning what their work will be like. Uh, I was speaking to a writing professor and there was a whole question about, you know, well, <laughs> how will I know if somebody's written their own work or if they've you know, gotten an AI to write the assignment for them? How will I know? And, 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 and if that ends up being a, an acceptable way to produce a written product, well, then what am I for? Why am I here? And do I need to do something different? So it's really, um, I think, uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, the upside is, is, is tantalizing, but, but there's, um, you know, but for other people, there's, there's, a, there's a downside that, they're, that they need to figure out what to do with. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's, that's the reality with any technology that comes out. I mean, you look at, at um, you know, you know, we had sailing ships. I mean, I spoke to a guy in the in the sauna the other night. He came to South Africa 50 years ago, an Austrian guy. And I asked him why he came. And he said, well, he was young and he was an adventurer and it was only a, a three week trip on the ship. Um, mm. And I was like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. You know, we take for granted that we just fly. And, you know, Absolutely. he was Absolutely. You know, he was explaining like this three week trip on the on the boat and you know, there was there was all this risk and all the rest of it. And then when he got here to go back it was another three week trip and he and he decided there was too you know, there was too much opportunity here and, and you know, in the time he was here it went from you know, taking buses everywhere to taking trains everywhere to to flying everywhere. So he travelled all over Africa in all those different modes of transport as they became more and more prevalent. And, mm -hmm. you know, that would have displaced so many different jobs and people had to have changed. So I think, I mean, in that sense, you know, I hear the, I hear the argument, but I think, you know, the, the, the good side is that you've got the opportunity. If you're willing to change, you can change. Um, right. This, this Absolutely. Stuff, this stuff's not going to kill off those jobs in the next 10 years, well, 20 years anyway. And, you know, I don't I don't. Uh, I don't bring it up because I'm trying to disparage the change. I bring it up because, you know, we're really talking about digital workspaces. And, you know, and some of these things are going to change a, a person's digital workspace in a way that will please them. And some of it will change their digital workspace in a way they don't know how to think about yet. And, um, and so I just think that that's just part of the landscape 
that we're in. Oh, sure. I, but what, what, so, so what I'm, what I was, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And what I was trying to get to with, with that person in particular is, who, who cares if they use the AI to write it? Because they still got to look at it and make sure they understand what the AI is written. Mm. It, but, it, but you know, the, the the method will have to change. And the, and I mean, look at it, the education systems like, and this is a, you know, we could talk about this one for hours. But, but the education system <laughs> is so archaic that it we is. need stuff like this to to think. I mean, I, I read a very good book series, which I recommend uh, by Rake Brown or Rick Brown uh, called The Frontier Saga. And I'm on the, the latest book. And basically, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a science fiction space opera just to give you some context. But they've gone, oh, forward, okay. they've gone forward 500 years. And the population now relies on AI so much that they don't know how to make any decisions for themselves, and and that's that's where I think is the is the is the line that's too far. Like I think you've still got to, you know, the whole point is to be a critical thinker, yeah, you know, understand what's in front of you, that kind of stuff. But I yeah. think that you know we value some cases so much effort on manual labor. You know, you worked eighteen hours today. Well, what did you produce? Oh, well, I wrote this ten thousand page thing. Okay. Was it was it any good? Well, I don't know. I just wrote it. You know, it was just it was a, a labor of love or whatever it was. That, you know, that's not necessarily conducive to quality or value. And I think this is where hopefully these tools will help us. And I mean, I think the reason why we need it in especially in the cyberspace is because I think there's such a volume of stuff coming. The only way to resolve it is to have some intelligence that 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 doesn't sleep, that's looking for you know, and and this is the Nirvana looking for the problems to help us to resolve them. Because at some point you're going to definitely get it from the attacking side, so you need to have it yeah. on the defense side. I agree. So, yeah. So yeah, that's. That, I mean, I suppose that's a bit of a. I don't want to say dystopian, but it kind of it kind of made me think of the Terminator threat that we've always worried about. You know, the, the, oh my the... gosh! You know, you could you could it, our fear of this manifests in story and movie, and there's there's no lack. There's Terminator. There's um. Uh, the Matrix, I think, is another yeah. really great dystopian, you know, uh, view of artificial intelligence and how humanity might lose control uh, of its destiny. Um, gosh, innumerable, you know, standalone episodes of uh, you know different shows. I mean, it's yeah. a deep fear that I think that we're we're grappling with as a as as a, as a as a race, as you know, humanity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think. And it must be something inherent in us that we're always looking for something to scare ourselves um, through stories. <laughs> well, I, I think there's there's no saber toothed tiger around the corner, right? But I still think we sort of have this uh, innate sense of you know what should I be afraid of? You know, like how how should I sensitize myself to you know the the, the what's the next threat so that you know I can be prepared? I, perhaps that's what it is. I don't know. Uh, no, I think I think you're right. I think we 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 still have those those um, things in our genetics, so we need to do it um, somewhere or another. Uh, so so last time we spoke, you wanted to offer out uh, a copy of the book to any listeners. Is is that still something you want to do? Oh yes, absolutely. So so very much want to do that, Ryan. Uh, so listen, I really appreciate the fact that you you know, have invited me to be on the episode here. And, and you gave me a chance to kind of share my perspective on cyber risk. And um, and you even put up with he hearing me talk about my book. Well, I don't think it's fair for me to talk about my book unless I uh, make it uh, available uh, to uh, to the folks who are listening in. And so that's, that's what I want to do. So uh if anybody would like uh, a copy of my book, I'd be happy to give you a free copy. Um, I've got a landing page. Uh, where you can go and, and retrieve it from. And we're going to put the URL to that in your show notes, if that's all right. Yep. And uh, and then people can just, can just go right to it and uh, just, uh, you know, give me your email address and we'll make the book available to you immediately. And I would love to get any feedback about the book that you might have after uh, after reading it. Um, I love to talk to people about about this topic and 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 i'm I'm thinking about you know does does my book need a new version, and if it does, you know what should change? So I'm always interested to hear what people think about it. so um thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my book with your audience. No, no problem at all. I, I mean, I started reading it, but I had to stop because we had to re-record. but uh, the first two chapters I read were really good, so i I recommend thank you. that uh, and then if people want to get hold of you, what's the best way? 
Well, uh, you can either send me a, an email, kip at cyberriskopportunities.com, or uh, perhaps the easier way would be to send me a message on LinkedIn. That's the social network that I uh, spend most of my time on. And uh, so either of, either of those two uh, would work well. Fantastic. Great. Well, we'll put that all in the notes as well and, and on your profile so people can get hold of you. Thanks so much for sharing all your thoughts. And, and that was, it's been a great chat. I think round two is actually better than round one in some respects. So uh, appreciate you making more time for me. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.